Hello everyone. The project I'm going to show today is quite old. I developed it back in 2020. It's a powerful electronic load that operates on the constant current principle, a very useful thing in a radio enthusiast's workshop. It is used in particular for discharging batteries, to determine their capacity, for loading power sources by current, for various stress tests and so on. Overall, in terms of usefulness in my lab, it ranks third after multimeters and laboratory power supplies. Currently, I have a professional electronic load and another factory-made one, which is 6 channel and is used, in particular, for discharging batteries. But all the loads shown have relatively low power. This sample, for example, is 300 watts. Often, when discharging large capacity batteries, for example, from small electric vehicles, this power is not enough because the discharge will be very long and it won't be possible to set high discharge currents. The presented homemade sample can provide a load of up to 1,000-1,200 watts, briefly even more. Its main feature is that it is a load operating on the principle of constant current. That is, you set the discharge current, say, 10 amperes, and during the discharge process, this current will always remain stable, regardless of the battery voltage. This method of discharge is precisely the correct one for determining the capacity of batteries. I made different versions of the boards. For this load, there is a 4-transistor version and this one with 8 transistors. To be fair, I must note that a long time ago I assembled such a monster, again at 1000-1200 watts, and used it successfully. This version is assembled on two 4-transistor boards and is fully operational. I used to work actively with batteries and used it very often. Another important feature of this load is that, firstly, it is scalable, and you can increase the power by adding several such boards, and also that each of the eight load channels is essentially independent of the others. Because of this, it is not necessary to use identical transistors in all channels, but it is important that they are rated for the appropriate current and voltage. The maximum load current is 48 amps, and the minimum current is from 0 amps, which is really cool. The voltage is ideally up to 150 volts, but I tested it at values no higher than 80 volts, and everything went smoothly. Again, it's important to understand that the specified parameters are strictly tied to the power. That is, you can't take, for example, a battery at 80 volts and discharge it with a current of 48 amps, because that's more than 3 and 8 kilowatts of power, which is above the maximum 1000, 1200 watts, the allowable power for our load. The load is equipped with protection against power reverse polarity. If you mix up the positive and negative, nothing will burn out. This protection is provided by four powerful diode assemblies at the power input. It's easy to guess that the entire main current flows through these diodes, and they heat up. That's why we install them on a common heatsink with the transistors. The accuracy of measurements is not affected by the losses on these diodes, as they are essentially part of the current load and measurements are taken before these diodes. At the load input, the circuit is quite simple, eight parallel independent channels. Current monitoring is carried out on each transistor separately. Operational amplifiers LM324 are responsible for control. Each chip has four channels, and we have two of these chips. All of this has a single reference source in the form of the TL431 chip. This chip generates the reference voltage, and by turning the variable resistors, we manually change this reference voltage. This voltage is applied to all the non-inverting inputs of the operational amplifiers. The voltage drop that occurs on the current sensors during load operation is applied to the inverting inputs. Then the voltage from the sensors is compared with the reference voltage. The operation is simple and based on the key function of the operational amplifier. The operational amplifier always strives for a state where the voltage difference at its inputs is zero, and it achieves this by adjusting its output voltage. That is, if the voltage drop from the current sensor, which comes to the first input, is higher than the reference voltage at the other input, the operational amplifier will decrease its output voltage, leading to the smooth closing of the power transistor. When the transistor closes, the resistance of its channel increases which leads to a decrease in the current through the transistor, and consequently, the current and the voltage drop across the shunt decrease, and therefore, the voltage at the inverting input decreases until it equals the voltage at the other input. 
Accordingly, current regulation is nothing more than the force change of the reference voltage on our part. By doing this, we make the operational amplifier compare the voltage drop with different reference voltages, thereby achieving the desired load current for our purposes. Construction. The device is built on a massive printed circuit board, which is double-sided and elegantly made, as it was manufactured by JLC PCB. This is a huge factory with a full production cycle, capable of producing printed circuit boards of any complexity with any technical specifications. You simply upload the Gerber files of your project, select the necessary options, pay, and that's it. The prices are the most affordable. Boards from 1 to 8 layers cost just $2. Boards can be manufactured in just 24 hours, and most importantly, their quality is amazing and will always remain so, due to the established technical process on ultra-precise machines. On the order page, you have access to a lot of options, many colors of solder mask, track coating materials, and board thicknesses. Also provides services for 3D printing and full assembly of your printed circuit boards, including component installation and testing. For SIGFLARE boards, there is currently a promotion with a $30 coupon. So, don't miss out. Easy to use, affordable to produce, reliable in operation, GLC PCB is a choice you can trust. The link to the company's website is in the description. Video. The current sensors in my version are regular low ohm resistors. Their resistance fluctuates depending on the heat, but in this case it's not that critical and doesn't significantly affect the operation. Transistors. I used IGBT transistors in a Super 2247 package as I have many of them. A long time ago, a kind subscriber gifted them to me. Here, it's important to understand that the load power depends specifically on the type of transistor package. The load is linear, and that's good because it won't introduce additional noise. Absolutely all professional electronic loads are linear. The downside is that it's literally a heater, as all the input power is converted into heat on the transistors, diodes, and current sensors, but mostly, of course, on the transistors. That's why the larger the substrate area and overall cooling, the better. You can use transistors in 2247 packages and even 2220. On the board, by the way, there are mounting bots for the 2220 package, but the final load power will be less. With good cooling, it's safe to handle a load of 320 to 350 watts using 8 transistors with 2247 packages 650 to 700 watts. The transistors I used 150 watts per transistor, but there is information that they can handle up to 300, and possibly that's true, but I wouldn't recommend taking the risk. In any case, considering 8 transistors the maximum power, load will be within 1200 watts. Imagine a heater at 1200 watts, and to prevent it all from burning out due to overheating, you need one radiator like this for every four transistors, and this is still not everything. You must definitely use powerful fans to cool down the entire system. The maximum current through each transistor is quite small, about 6 amperes. This will allow for a wider selection of transistors, including those with lower current ratings, but I recommend using transistors with a current of at least 15 amperes. The drain source or collector emitter voltage of the transistor should be at least 200 volts. And regarding the drain source, I mention it for a reason. Of course, in this load you can use field effect transistors without any modifications. Just install field effect transistors with the required current instead of IGBT and voltage. Assembly. Well, there's not much to say here aside from a few points. Current sensors during soldering should not be installed too close to the board. There should be a gap of a couple to a few millimeters for optimal cooling of the sensor and to minimize heat transfer from the sensor to the board. The circuit includes two variable resistors for coarse and fine current adjustment. High quality resistors should be used. If you want, you can use a multi turn resistor, which allows you to set the load current very precisely. In this case, you can use just one resistor. Power traces must be. Reinforced with copper conductors and thoroughly tinned. 50 amps of current is no joke. Load power supply, 14 to 20 volts. You can use sources of both direct and alternating current since there is a rectifier at the input. 
low power power supply will do because the system control consumes very little current. Power supply of 1 amp is more than enough even with excess. I recommend powering the fans from a separate source. Important! This load in this configuration only has reverse polarity protection. It does not have thermal protection or protection from over voltage. However, currently on the market, there are quite impressive monitors for current voltage capacity and everything else which not only display all the load parameters, but also provide all the mentioned protections. I strongly recommend complementing the load with such a device and get a fully functional professional instrument. Such monitors have an external temperature sensor, and you can also connect a powerful relay to them, which can be installed at the load input, and in case of anything, the load will be disconnected. This is quite convenient because you can monitor the temperature of the heat sinks of the load and disconnect it due to overheating, as well as the batteries you will be discharging. These devices also allow you to set limits for the upper and lower voltage thresholds, a current limit which will prevent the load from burning out and the battery from being completely discharged. And in addition to all this, monitoring via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi on the screen of your smartphone, you will be able to see the discharge capacity as well as the current voltage temperature and everything else, which is extremely convenient. Is it worth the effort to assemble? Such a load? Absolutely, yes, because the cost in the case of a DIY project, even considering a cool monitor will cost, well, at most $150 to $180. Now, find me a factory-made load of a kilowatt, plus that costs the same. You won't find one. The minimum, such a load, will cost $500 and up. Good samples exceed $1,000. So it's worth it if you need something like this. Of course, you can manage with simple and relatively budget-friendly modules, but these are options that are made with total cost cutting on everything, particularly on key aspects, such as cooling. But with a DIY project, you don't have to skim, and you can install larger heat sinks. And the best part is, a DIY project has high repairability and a simple design. This video is coming to an end. The full project archive, as always, can be downloaded for free in the video description. Rate this video, comment, share with friends, and that will be the best support. For the author, it's time to say goodbye. As always, this was Kazyanov K. And until we meet again, goodbye.